Hello and welcome to the fourth video for the Bronte Network. In this episode I will be discussing this book, Elizabeth Gaskell's Life of Charlotte. The Life of Charlotte Bronte was first published in 1857, so several years after Charlotte had died. And this book is still regarded as an important source of biographical information. However, there are a few issues with it that I would like to address. First and foremost, Gaskell is a novelist best known for her works North and South, Ruth, Cranford, Sylvia's Lovers and Mary Barton. And so with this in mind, it is perhaps unsurprising that this book at times takes a novelistic tone. But the book's tone is not simply novelistic. It aims to present Charlotte almost as a saint. As anybody who has read this book will immediately note, Charlotte's works are notably absent, mentioned only fleetingly. Much more information is given about Charlotte's domestic life, for instance the peeling of the potatoes. So why is Gaskell foregrounding the domestic and the small? over the great and mighty works of Charlotte Bronte. Well, on the one hand, Gaskell was a Unitarian, a religious group who celebrated presenting Christ sympathetically. So it is not really surprising that she would continue this sympathetic representation in this biography. Yet there is another reason for Gaskell's somewhat biased telling of Charlotte's historical facts. After the publication of Jane Eyre, Charlotte Bronte was vilified in the critical press as being a coarse and unwomanly writer, and so to some extent Gaskell can be seen to try and reclaim Charlotte's reputation, that by presenting her as virtuous and sainted, she is undermining the contemporary critical representations of Charlotte as unwomanly, un impure, and inappropriate. An example of this can be found when Gaskell describes the parsonage. Everything about the place tells of the most dainty order, the most exquisite cleanliness. The doorsteps are spotless, the small old-fashioned window panes glitter like looking glass. Inside and outside of that house, cleanliness goes up into its essence, purity. So, the parsonage, which is, as we know, grey and located in an industrial mill town, is being presented almost as a shrine. It is a pure and immaculately clean, godly space in which the virtuous Charlotte and her family reside. If we turn to chapter 6, we are given a description of Charlotte. She was a very quiet, thoughtful girl of nearly 15 years of age, very small in figure, Stunted was the word she applied to herself, but as her limbs and head were in just proportion to the slight, fragile body, no word in ever so slight a degree suggestive of deformity could probably be applied to her. So from this description, the key words to note are small, fragile and slight. So far from being some masculine, deranged figure as the contemporary critics would have liked to have presented her, Charlotte was a young girl who was suffering in the Christian mode of meekness. But it is not just Charlotte who suffers at Gaskell's novelistic hand, so too does her father Patrick. Gaskell reports on one of the village inhabitants who writes, I used to think them spiritless. They were so different to any children I had ever seen. In part, I set it down to a fancy Mr. Bronte had of not letting them have flesh meat to eat. So as a vegetarian myself, the idea that being vegetarian makes one spiritless and undernourished is somewhat bizarre. But the simple fact of the matter is the Bronte children were not vegetarian. There is a letter in which Emily discusses having meat for dinner. In addition, Gaskell in this very book quotes a letter from Charlotte debating what meat to get their father to eat. So this idea of the Bronte sisters being undernourished seems to me to be another one of Gaskell's inventions. Further on in the book, Gaskell describes Patrick Bronte's temper and how he would 
gather up the rug, throw it into the grate, and set it alight before proceeding to chop up the chairs. And this description of Patrick's brutality seems somewhat jarring. Patrick was a man who was terrified of fire, so the idea that he would burn household objects seems incredibly unlikely. And it seems to be further evidence for Gaskell's aim of presenting the Bronte family as sufferers, suffering not only from physical frailness, but from the tyranny of their father. In addition, the very opening of the book sets up the remoteness of the Howarth Parsonage, where, as anyone who has been to Howarth will tell you, the Parsonage is really just a short hop from the High Street, far from being Wuthering Heights-esque in the way Gaskell would present it. So what does Gaskell say about the other members of the Bronte family? Well, not a lot is the short answer. However, she does spend significant time dwelling on Anne and Emily's shyness and reserve. So again, far from being writers who had presented and written these ferocious books of drunkenness, debauchery and violence, they were seen as shy, retiring girls who simply did not know what it was that they had produced. In a similar way, turning back to Charlotte, she describes how she was only 18 months older than Emily, but Emily and Anne were simply companions and playmates, while Charlotte was motherly friend and guardian to both. And this loving assumption of duties beyond her years made her feel considerably older than she really was. So again, we're presented with a Charlotte who is so dutiful that she is sacrificing her youth to look after her sisters. This is an angel in the house figure, not someone who had written Jane Eyre, but rather the Victorian domestic goddess. So with all this in mind, how should we respond to this book today? Gaskell herself recognised it as controversial, particularly her depictions of the Robinson family, whose affair with Bramwell I've discussed in an earlier episode. Gaskell was so worried about the reception of her book that she quit the country to Europe upon its publication, and so the scandal would have largely blown over by the time she returned. Nonetheless, at the Robinsons' insistence, she cut all mention of them from the second edition, and I think the best way to view it today is a fictional book that just happens to be about a real person. Gaskell was, after all, in the privileged position of knowing Charlotte personally and considered her her friend. So with this in mind, this book provides an interesting snapshot into the lives of the Howarth inhabitants, as well as the 19th century more widely, just as long as one doesn't take it too seriously.